there is something reserved for the heart that only the love of Jesus can fulfill. Loneliness, I think, is a fruit of not knowing how much you are loved by God. I was that lonely kid. I smoked weed every single day for like a year. That didn't work. Bumped it up to shrooms, took shrooms, overdosed on shrooms. Trying to find my satisfaction in every possible category other than Christ himself. The mystery of the Christian faith is that Christ is inside me. How much did the blood of Jesus work that now Christ could dwell inside of me and there not be a conflict of interest? Because Christ can only dwell in holy places because he's God. So if Christ is in me, how much did the blood actually work? What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the King Division Podcast. My name is Cole Harris, and today is another great episode that I am so, so passionate about, a topic that I'm passionate about, and it it centers around our identity. When we understand our identity in Christ, who we are because of Christ, who we are now that Christ lives in us, it changes the perspective in which we view everything changes, and particularly the topic that I want to talk about today is loneliness. Many times people are struggling with sin, have struggled with sin, one-off sins. I've been having conversations that loneliness tends to lead people to committing sins. Uh, Loneliness may lead you into getting into a dating relationship that you know you shouldn't be in, Uh, friend groups that you know you shouldn't be in just because you want to be popular, you want to seek to fill that loneliness, you just hang out with whoever will accept you. Uh, Pornography is a big one. Loneliness, for some reason, for a lot of people, leads them into pornography. Um, And maybe even worse than all of that, which isn't even committing sins, but you're walking around not knowing how loved you are, in, in other words, you don't have your identity. You don't know your identity. And so you're just walking around looking for affirmation subtly, which you're going to find from culture or your circumstances. And uh, that just leaves you in a position to where you're going to go like this. You're going to yo-yo back and forth because your circumstances and culture, if there's two things that they are, or if there's one thing that they are, it's not consistent. And so when you don't know how loved you are by God, you will begin to yo-yo in your relationship. In your life, you will begin to find inconsistencies just everywhere, everywhere. Um, and so today, I want to preach about loneliness and uh, why the love of God, there's something reserved in your heart for the love of God and only the love of God can fulfill it in your heart. And I want to talk about that today. We believe Jesus, a lot of people believe Jesus died for everyone. Jesus died for people. But until you believe Jesus died for you, you will always have an issue of self-worth. Let me say that again. We we realize that Jesus died for the masses, for the people. But until you believe that Jesus died for you individually, you will always have an issue of self-worth. The breakthrough that you are wanting is on the other side of learning to be loved by God. Okay, and I'm going to prove to you that this is... It's on the other side of this is because why does this statement trigger us? John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Something about this. If you love me, you will abide in me. If you love me, you will do this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Always reading this, something about it triggers us. And at first glance, it could seem counterintuitive to what I've been preaching on my previous episodes, that if you are experiencing a cyclish nature of your in your sin, then it's because you don't know how loved you are by God, because God does not love you before or after, not or partaking in sin, partaking or not partaking in righteousness. It's not contingent on actions. God's love for you is contingent on His. He just loves you freely for who you are, your personality, the way you look, the way you like everything about you he's in love with okay so at first glance this seems in uh tension with that reality if you love me then you will keep my commandments if you keep my commandments then you love me that seems a bit contingent like in contingency right that seems a bit counterintuitive well let me tell you it's not because you have the order wrong john 14 18 says i will not leave you as orphans i will come to you Yet a little while in the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. 
Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Okay, we see that he it is who loves me, who keeps my commandments. But the verse right before, you'll notice there's an order to this whole deal. The only way to love God and the only way to love others, the only way to display righteousness in any real meaningful way is to first know that you are loved by God. This is the gospel. Not that we love God, but that he loved us first. In verse 19, or in verse 20, in that day, you will know that I am in my Father, in you and me, and I in you. So the reality that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father, then produces, verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Let me prove it to you again. John 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Hold on. Crazy reality there. As the Father has loved Jesus, so Jesus loves us. That's how he loves us. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And so what I've realized is the understanding of keeping commandments. I've always read John 15, John 14. And been confused because it's like, how do I, I thought this love that Jesus had for me was unconditional apart from my righteousness, apart from anything that I could do for him. I thought that, that he, that I, that that's what our relationship was contingent on. But we treat Jesus like he's not a genuine teacher. We treat Jesus like he's arrogant, like he's prideful, manipulative. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments um, with attitude. And I was just reminded by the Holy Spirit this past week that could Jesus be this good of a teacher? Is Jesus this good? Because we have to understand, let's back up and look at this in a big picture. Jesus is either all the way loving or all the way manipulative. But sometimes we kind of deal with Jesus in gray areas, right? Where it's like, I feel like he's being manipulative. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But then sometimes he's loving, saying, I don't have to keep his commandments at all, and he still loves me. Romans 5, 8 through 9 is an example of that. For Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. Okay. So what's the what's the what's the balance? What's the relationship between his love not being contingent on anything that I do, yet I'm still called to do the very things. I'm still called to walk in righteousness. I'm still called to bear the fruits of the Spirit. How do you balance those two? And you balance those two with this reality that I know that Jesus has loved me first. I know that. And not just knowing it, but receiving it. I've tangibly received the supernatural love of Jesus. It's changed my heart. My heart of stone is now a heart of flesh. And now out of actively receiving the love of Jesus, I now have the capability, which I did not have prior, to love God to minister to God, to praise his name. I was in bondage to sin, slavery, and I was in bondage to all the things. His love freed me. Now I have the ability to love him back, to love others, to display fruit to the righteousness, to to do what John 14, 15 says, to keep his commandments and love him. If you abide in my love, then you will keep my father's commandments knowing it it's knowing he's saying it in love and for my benefit that means that he could be saying keep my commandments and i could experience more of him could he be such a good teacher that this isn't actually manipulation but he's actually trying to guide us into the full experience of him Could it be that he's not trying to manipulate us and that he's trying to guide us to experience him in the most full capacity? But this is all contingent on the order of operations is that Jesus says in John 15, 9, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now he commands us to abide in his love. We can only abide in his love by keeping commandments, you know, doing righteous things from the position of, I know he's loved me first. And let me prove it to you in John 13. He says it again, John 13. He's is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. It's one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. And Jesus is about to go to the cross. He has hours left before he's about to be crucified. He could be doing anything he wants. And he's, in John 13, washing his disciples' feet. He says, knowing where he's come from, knowing where he's going, knowing he's going to the cross, out of all the things I could be doing, 
I'm going to do this. He takes a towel, wraps it around his waist, fills a water of basin, fills uh, a basin full of water, and begins to wash his disciples' feet. You'll notice in John 13, 8, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. Then Simon Peter said to him, Lord, do not only wash my feet, but my hands and my head also. I'll prove it again to you. John 15, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Another verse of what we just talked about. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Don't get it twisted. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in my name and he, whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give it to you. Don't get it twisted. If you are my friend, you will do what I command you. John 15, 14. But in verse 16, he said, you did not choose me. I chose you you that you should bear fruit and it should abide in me by doing what I command you by walking in righteousness. Do you see that there's an order to this whole deal that being loved by Jesus is the first step and even Peter gets rebuked by Jesus for not letting him love and serve him. And this is all before Jesus died on the cross. Romans 5, 6 through 8, Christ died for us while we were sinners. We're talking about loneliness here, okay? So I'm presenting this love narrative that is Jesus and John, John 13, 14, 15, some other references in the book of John, the gospel of John. I'm trying to show y'all and make an argument that Jesus is loving and all of that we're talking about, Jesus washing his disciples' feet, doing miracles, healing people's blind eyes, doing all this stuff was before he even went to the cross. And so Christ died for us while we were sinners, he was beaten, he was whipped, mocked, all of the things. For what reason? Like, we must grasp for what reason. He's either all the way loving or he's all the way manipulative. We must get out of the gray area, make a decision. Is Jesus loving or is he manipulative? And then any manipulative thought that comes in your mind must fall to the wayside because you know he's loving because he cannot we we're, we're forming an image of jesus that is wishy-washy on the day and truthfully how we feel determines who jesus is okay jesus died on the cross for you jesus died on the cross so that you could be reconciled back to him because you were separated eternally by your sin Have you ever heard of the parable of the two debtors? Because I think this is going to free you from ever thinking Jesus doesn't love you. For some of us, there's a disconnect between like, I know we, I've sinned before, but I also don't think I'm a terrible person. Like I didn't murder anybody. I haven't done like these totally crazy things, but I know I've sinned. And so what's the connection? And and so I feel a shallow love because I don't feel like that bad of a person. The Lord's about to free you from that through this scripture. There's a parable in Luke. I think it is uh, Luke 7 verses 36 through 50. Write it down. Go read it. So Jesus is getting dinner with a Pharisee at his house. This is Pharisee's name is Simon. A woman barges in uninvited. Okay, you can already see this woman doesn't give a crap about any sort of order or ethics or anything. She's like, I want Jesus. I'm going to give him the praise that he is deserving of. And so she comes in with the alabaster jar full of ointment, breaks it at his feet, and begins to wipe the feet with the ointment, her hair, her tears. She's weeping. Jesus, you are worthy. You are worthy. I don't know what she was saying. I'm assuming she was like worshiping him and praising him. And this Pharisee named Simon says, Jesus must not be a prophet because if he was a prophet, he would know who this woman was. And this woman, it's believed to be a woman of the city, probably a prostitute, regardless was a a sinner and of the bad kind, had done lots of bad things. Then Jesus in all his wisdom begins to tell a parable, right? That represents him being the Pharisee, the person who he obviously has sinned because Romans 3.23 says, For all have fallen short of the glory of God, um, but the free gift of God is eternal life. I just butchered that, but you get, For all have fallen short of the glory of God. And so Simon the Pharisee has obviously sinned, and then this woman has obviously sinned. 
but he's a Pharisee, so he can't be that bad. And this woman was a prostitute, so she's really bad. So he said there was two debtors, one owed 50 and one owed 500. Now, say, suppose that the debtor, I'm sorry, that the, per the person who was owed the debt decided to forgive them both of their debt. He asked Simon, who is going to love him more? Simon pr begin, proceeds to say, uh, supposedly the one that who was forgiven more. Supposedly, the, the woman who had the bigger debt, the person who had the bigger debt would be more thankful if the debt of both of them were forgiven. One owed 50, one owed 500, one owed 50 dollars, one owed 5 million. Who would be more thankful? The person who owed 5 million dollars. And so, Jesus says, you are right in saying so. And in verse 43, he says, you have, Jesus says, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. <coughs> Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table began to say among themselves, who is this who can forgive sins? And he said to the women, your faith has saved you, go in, go in peace. So, those who are forgiven much love much. But let's ask the question, does that mean that the grace of God and the people who are forgiven of the most, that means if you have these crazy testimonies, that means you can love Jesus more than the person who didn't have a crazy testimony. No, 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 no. That's not what Jesus is saying. Because I believe that if Simon knew what Romans 6 said, it wasn't pinned down yet, Paul didn't write it yet, yet it was still truth, right? He could have grasped this idea. If he would have understand that the wages of sin is death. The wage of one sin is death. The law, to be righteous, you have to be perfect. To be righteous outside of Jesus, you have to be perfect. To be righteous outside of Jesus, you have to adhere to the law perfectly. And if you break one law, you deserve to die. That's why they would kill bulls, goats, lambs, heifers to atone from their sins because death was needed to atone for sin. And Likewise, one sin breaks your now it's there's no mixture to holiness. It's either holy or not holy. So if he would have known that Romans 6:23 says for the wages of sin is death. If you sin, the payment you get for sin is you deserve to die and be eternally separated from God forever. I believe he would have been on his knees begging and worshiping, and weeping, and crying, not caring about order, not caring about athletes, ethics, Jesus is in the room, on his knees, weeping, saying, Jesus, you are worthy, and praising him, just like the prostitute would, because he would have known that his sin actually separated him from God, just like her sin. There's an element to this, of course, of course Simon didn't sin as much as this prostitute did. The definition of debt, if you owe 50 or 5 million, it doesn't matter how much you owe, debt by definition is you do not have the ability to pay it back. That's debt. But in our minds, we are confused. We are confused because we think 50 isn't that much. So then a few good deeds, a month's worth of work, then I can just work it back up and I'll be good. A few good deeds and I'll kind of wipe away. You know, but the prostitute, you can't wipe, you can't do enough good deeds to wipe away prostitution. That's terrible. Actually, the wages of sin is death. And so, it doesn't matter if you are a Pharisee and you've been in church all your life and you've done, you're the little good kid, who, the little good homeschool kid who's done everything right in your whole life. You have sinned once. You deserve death because you have sinned. And if you really grasp the idea of what sin actually merits for people who are not in Christ, then you would be weeping in the presence of Jesus like the woman in Luke 7. Like if you are struggling to realize how much Jesus loves you, think about your sin. 
Think about how imperfect you have been. Think of Think upon the things you've done in your life and begin to connect these two dots that say, my sin put Jesus up on that cross. If you're having trouble relating to Jesus died for me, well then relate your sin to putting him on the cross. Because my sin put Jesus on that cross. My sin, the time I did X, Y, and Z, actually is why Jesus had to die, had to be whipped, flogged, beyond, he bled to death. Because of my sin, all of a sudden you'll be, begin to realize that actually, no, 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 he loved me enough to die and then resurrect. And then now that becomes a personal one-on-one -on -one love when you attribute, oh, my sins actually sent him to the cross. There is no place to think Jesus has a shallow love for you. Jesus either loves you radically and it's the most crazy love the world has ever seen or he doesn't love you at all. We must get out of the gray area. There is something reserved for the heart that only the love of Jesus can fulfill. And we're talking about loneliness, and this is very much correlated, it's very much connected, because loneliness, I think, is a fruit of not knowing how much you are loved by God. If you don't know that I can be locked away with God for three days in my bedroom and not talk to a soul, yet never feel lonely, then there's a disconnect between the, the God you serve because his love, it says that the Father and Jesus will come and make their home in me. Jesus lives in me by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is living in my skin, in my soul. He is living inside of me. The, the Holy Spirit who was hovering over the waters in Genesis 1 is living inside of my body and in your body. How could you be lonely understanding that Jesus is living Christ in you. It says in Colossians, it talks about the mystery of the ages. What is the mystery of the Christian faith? The mystery of the Christian faith is that Christ is inside me. The mystery of the Christian faith is that Jesus had to dwell in temples and buildings and to go into his presence into the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament. There could be no sin. They had to kill like 20 goats, 20 bulls, 20 heifers, 20 goats to then, okay, now I'm clean. I can go into the presence of God. Okay, but now Christ is living in me. So how much did the blood of Jesus work? That now Christ could dwell inside of me and there not be a conflict of interest. Because Christ can only dwell in holy places because he's God. So if Christ is in me, how much did the blood actually work? And I'm lonely? And I'm lonely? Like, <laughs> bro, how could you be lonely understanding that I am righteous, clean, and holy because of Christ in me, because of the blood of Jesus that has cleansed me, and now the God of all creation dwells inside of me. That's the mystery of the Christian faith. My testimony with loneliness and kind of like my story, I've never really shared my story, but I was that lonely kid. I had a great family. I was very much loved, very much had, I had money. We, we I grew up like not wealthy, but I mean wealthy. Yeah, I, I mean my family had money, was good at sports, had a lot of friends, had a great family. But if there's one thing that I think could describe who I was and what I felt, I was always lonely. And it's just so weird to say that. It's so weird for somebody, even for those of y'all who are listening, to be like, wow, I'm, I'm lonely right now. I'm not, ex it's just a, it's a weird thing to feel because you know you have a lot of things. And like I said before, it's because there's something reserved in your heart that only the love of God can fulfill. And a natural thing of the love of God not fulfilling it is for you to feel lonely. And that's why you can be confused all your life of like, I have a lot of things, but something's off. I just don't feel satisfied. Something's off. But for me, I would always feel lonely. And I then began to pursue and try to find it that fix that answer to loneliness in pornography. I started watching porn like really young, like elementary school all throughout elementary was stuck on it man stuck on it then I graduated I guess you can say I was I treated girls wrong was very much in the world in that sense um didn't save myself for marriage trying to find my that fulfillment to my soul in that um 
sports. I was really good at basketball, but there was something I was feeding off of. The applauses and the praises of people and how much it could serve me. That's why I played sports is because it gave me clout. It boosted me. Gave me dopamine hit. Then that ended. I play start. I go play college basketball for a year, my freshman year, and there's only four people in the stands. It's small D three college. So then obviously I'm not feeding off of the. I got to switch something up. And so, leave there. I start smoking weed. I smoked weed every single day for like a year. That's what I was trying to use to fulfill that lonely thing in my heart. That didn't work. Bumped it up to shrooms. Took shrooms. Overdosed on shrooms. Had a freaking panic attack. Had a big old thing with shrooms. And all of that, all of that was a result of me trying to find my satisfaction in every possible category other than Christ himself. And I finally said in February of 2020... I am done living life my way. Jesus, I will live life your way. And I still didn't even comprehend. I, th- that's the grace of God that I got saved. Even not even comprehending what I was praying, but Christ even worked it through me because I said, I'm going to do it your way, meaning that I'm going to follow the Bible and what you say to do. And uh, because I've tried to live in my own logic and my own reasoning and it just left me, left me empty and broken and I just didn't work. But... Little did I know, I thought I was going to change my actions, but Christ filled my heart. The Holy Spirit filled my heart, and I experienced Christ in me, and ultimately the satisfaction of knowing that I was loved by my Heavenly Father. And uh, it cleansed my soul of all unrighteousness. It cleansed my soul of all impurities. It cleansed my soul of all loneliness that was leading me to the impurities. It cleansed my soul of the loneliness that was leading me to all the bad decisions that I was making. Loneliness was the motivator to everything. And for some it's loneliness. For some it's, I think, a lack of identity, a lack of knowing you're loved by by God doesn't just have to produce loneliness. It can be a, a multitude of different things. But I do know this. I do know that not knowing your love by God is setting yourself up for a breeding ground of just a whole bunch of hogwash, you could say. It's just setting you up for failure because things are going to then, if you're not motivated by the love of Jesus, you're going to be motivated by something else and it will always let you down. It will, it's just not a good place to be because Christ is the only one who's perfect. His love is inexhaustible. It doesn't change on the day. Um, it doesn't change on how I feel. It never changes based on any metric or any variable. It's the same every single day. And the hardest thing that I've had to learn, that I've grown in, is realizing that I can wake up and Christ's love still is out. I'm not waiting for the other shoe to drop. Wow, is this the day that Christ's love actually stops and now i got to work hard again for my righteousness? No, no, no. Christ's love since February 2020 has sustained me every single day and it's never wavered. And the only thing that's wavered is, is my recognition of the love he's had for me. The only thing that's wavered is... If Christ, lo- if Christ has been in me since February, and I'll just use me as an example, just like all of us probably experience, uh, the loneliness I felt before I was saved kind of came back after I was saved. You know, you experience seasons of loneliness, seasons of depression. Uh, I'll even be vulnerable. A week and a half ago, I got this feeling of loneliness. And so, which I'll address it and I deal with it differently now, which is where I'm going to get to practicals. Um, we have to think if this stuff crops back up after salvation. So we have to ask the question, we know Christ's love never changed. We know Jesus didn't change. And so the only thing that if I'm feeling depressed or anxious or lonely, the only thing that could have changed is my understanding of the love that he has for me. Like that's the beauty of the gospel is that his love never changes. He has served me. He has died for me, loves me, continually serves me, and it's perfect, never changing on the day. And so if by the day my emotions feel not loved, I feel lonely, I feel depressed, that means it's something in me that's not recognizing his love that he has for me.
His love never changes, so if something changes, it can't be him. It must be us. And so we must recenter, realign ourselves continually with what does he say about me and how much does he love me. And I remind myself of that continually, daily. And if loneliness is motivating me to do something, I rebuke it and I repent. So that kind of gets me into some practicals here. I kind of got ahead of myself. First practical is I need y'all to begin to identify the places where you are feeling lonely and it's leading you to attach yourself to things to fill that space. Are you using things as medication? Are you using things to fill that void that was meant for God? The first step in anything is recognition. Okay, I recognize that this is an issue um, and then repent. Begin to recognize where those those habits, those uh, you are feeding on the applauses of man. You are attaching yourself to this person. Codependency is a big one um, amongst friendships and friend groups. Um, you will become codependent on a person just because you don't want to be lonely. Just begin to identify whatever it is. Identify what it is and then just pray and uh, repent. Don't let it happen. And that repentance doesn't mean, sometimes it would mean cutting something off, especially if it's a glaring sin. Like if you're going to pornography because you feel lonely, obviously pornography, regardless of the reason, is sin. So you must repent and just put away all all cleanliness, all unrighteousness. Um, but in terms of like relationships and stuff like that, um, sometimes God will ask you to, to cut off the friendship. Sometimes it just comes down to you getting right with God and viewing a relationship in a, in a new healthy lens. And so just pray about it and see what happens with that. But the second practical thing I want to talk to you about is use your lonely emotions as a sign to pray. Use your lonely emotions as a sign to pray. If you begin to feel lonely, use that as a cue to begin in that moment. I believe it's in the moment. Get on your knees or in your car or at work and pray, Lord, would your love flood my heart? Lord, would your love minister to my heart? Wherever I feel lonely, Lord, I, I surrender it to you. I know that you love me. I know that I'm valued by you. And I know that I'm valued by you because you bled for me. So, love, I, so God, I would pray that you would minister to my heart in this moment. You would minister your love to me and remind me again because you are a good, loving, generous God eagerly seeking to show us love would you remind me and minister to my heart um, my value and who I am to you and just begin to pray those things begin to pray when you feel lonely every time pray and allow that part of your heart then you're allowing the Holy Spirit to minister to that part of your heart if you feel lonely you're like ah, oh, like I know God's supposed to love me but you don't pray well then it's like what are you doing you're just recognizing the problem no I begin to allow the Holy Spirit to move in that place and the way the two ways the Holy Spirit moves is worship and prayer because those are the two things that require the Holy Spirit to do I mean you you are engaging with the Holy Spirit you are engaging with God when you pray and when you worship and so it's not okay just to see these lonely emotions and be like oh I know that's a problem no begin to pray begin to worship and allow the love of God to flood your heart and flush out flush it out allow the love of God that God will flush it out because he's a jealous God he wants your heart so pray when you have lonely emotions pray fall in love with God. This is the third practical. Loneliness is a fruit of not knowing your identity in Christ. Loneliness is also a fruit of allowing things of this world to have a hold on your heart that they were not meant to have. There are parts of you that aren't satisfied until you have something specific, whether it's a thing, whether it's a relationship, whether it's success, whether it's there's parts of you that aren't satisfied until you have something. And loneliness, dissatisfaction, all of the things will always exist until you become content in Jesus without having the thing. You'll know you're not in the right place is when you don't have the thing and you aren't satisfied. Because when your heart is in the correct place and Jesus is number one in your life, even if you don't have a relationship I think dating is a big part of it. If you aren't married, but you don't feel satisfied until you get married, like you're like, I, I, I feel empty. I feel like I'm not complete because I'm not married. 
I feel incomplete. I'm preaching to myself right now. I'm preaching to myself right now on this, that you don't feel complete until you are reach a certain skill level. I'm a videographer, guys. I'm a videographer, guys. And it's like, I want to be the best. Like God calls us to excellence and I want to be the best. I'm inspired by these great videographers, great content creators who make dynamic videos. I'm like, I want to, I want to be the best, but I preach it to myself daily, hourly. I mean, if my satisfaction is based on where, when I arrive at that skill level, that means my heart is in the wrong place. I must become eternally, completely satisfied in Jesus and exist in the tension of, I do not have something yet, but I'm still satisfied. And that's how you know your heart's in the right place. There are parts of you that aren't satisfied because you have placed your satisfaction in a thing and you know it's not in God because when you don't have it, you aren't satisfied. When in reality, you not having it and not being satisfied means there's a part of your heart the Lord doesn't have. And you not being satisfied proves it. Let me simplify. God wants you to be satisfied in His Son. The breakthrough you are looking for is valuing Jesus more than anything. And the only way to value Jesus is to know that He values you. And the reason breakthrough hasn't come is because you still value any one thing more than Him. How do you know? Because you are not satisfied. As a result, many different things could occur from this dynamic, loneliness being one of many. Jesus wants your whole heart He proved that by bleeding for you. Even more so, he did it knowing you might not ever thank him for it, but he still said you are worth it. That's the end of this podcast, guys. I pray it blessed you. I'm going to pray real quick, actually. Let me pray. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for the people who are listening. Thank you that you want to love them more than they want to love you. Thank you that when when I say the statement, like we must learn how to receive the love from you, Jesus, thank you that I I thank you that you want to love us more than we could ever love you. Thank you that you have always been far above than what I could ever imagine. Your love has always been more radical than my mind could even comprehend. You have always been more loving than I could ever give you credit for. That's who you are. That God is your character that you always give far above what is deserved, namely your love, Jesus. I pray that you would flood the hearts of the people listening, flood their hearts with your love, allow the loneliness, Holy Spirit, bring into remembrance these podcasts, plant it in their brain, that when they feel lonely, that it's a sign to begin to get on their knees and pray to you and ask you, because only you are the Savior of our souls, the Savior of our hearts, the lover of our hearts, that your love would begin to flush out all loneliness, all symptoms of not knowing their identity in you, that you are loved, that they are loved by you. So begin, Holy Spirit, to minister to the people listening. Do a mighty work in their lives, and I pray that they would walk in identity and freedom um, and sonship in you, in you, Jesus. Amen. Uh, That's the end of this podcast. I pray it blesses y'all, and uh, we'll see you in the next one.